Hello everyone. Welcome to Digital Communication Tutorials. In this video, I'm going to discuss the transmitter and receiver of quadriphase shift key, which is also denoted as QPSK. Figure 1 here shows the block diagram of a typical QPSK transmitter. The input binary sequence B of T is represented in its polar form. Please note the sequence B of T should be represented in its polar form. That is, symbol 1 is represented by a pulse of amplitude plus root EB, whereas symbol 0 is represented by a pulse of amplitude minus root EB. This binary wave is divided by means of a demultiplexer into two separate binary waves consisting of odd and even numbered input bits. Please note the input binary wave is split into two separate binary waves. The first binary wave which is B1 of T consists only of the odd numbered bits in the input binary sequence whereas the second binary wave represented by B2 of T consists of only the even numbered bits of the input binary sequence. It should be noted that in any signaling interval, the amplitudes of B1 of T and B2 of T will equal the signal coefficients SI1 and SI2 respectively, depending upon the particular debit that is being transmitted. Please note, this is a QPSK system. So the system will take two bits of information at a time and two bits of information is generally called as a debit. Further, the two binary waves B1 of T and B2 of T are then given to two product modulators that are fed with a pair of quadrature carriers. Please note, the orthonormal basis functions phi1 of T and phi2 of T are quadrature carriers. You should also understand each of the branches in the transmitter here is nothing but a binary phase shift keying transmitter. It is nothing but a product modulator. So each of them will work as a product modulator as in the case of binary phase shift keying technique. The output of each product modulator is a binary PSK wave. Therefore, the QPSK transmitter generates a pair of binary PSK waves both here as well as here. And these can be detected independently at the receiver due to the orthogonality of the basis functions phi1 of t and phi2 of t. Finally, the two binary PSK waves are added to produce the desired QPSK wave. Coming to the mathematical aspects, we should note that each symbol in the QPSK system is of 2 bits length. Therefore, the symbol duration of QPSK, which is capital T, is twice as that of the bit duration TB as in the case of a binary PSK system. So, capital T is equals to 2TB. We know that for a binary PSK system, the bit rate and the bit duration are related by the equation Rb equals 1 divided by Tb. So, the transmission bandwidth of the binary PSK system is equal to Rb equals to 1 divided by Tb. Please note, this is for binary PSK. I have included this portion because if you look at the transmitter diagram, each branch in the transmitter is nothing but a binary PSK transmitter. That is why I have written the equations for the bit rate and transmission bandwidths of BPSK here. Let us now write the same for QPSK. In a QPSK system, the transmission bandwidth is given by BQPSK is equals to transmission rate RQPSK equals to 1 divided by capital T. As per this equation, capital T is equals to 2TB. I will substitute that here. And now I will compare this equation with binary PSK bandwidth. So, since binary PSK bandwidth is 1 by TB, 1 by 2TB can be written as the bandwidth of binary PSK divided by 2. Therefore, for a given bit rate of 1 by TB, a QPSK wave requires only half the transmission bandwidth of the corresponding binary PSK system. Also, for the given transmission bandwidth BQPSK, the transmission rate RQPSK will be twice that of the RBPSK. That is, the QPSK wave carries twice as many bits of information as the corresponding binary PSK wave. Let us now move on towards the receiver. Since the QPSK transmitter uses two orthonormal basis functions, the QPSK receiver will have two correlators, each of which is supplied 
with a locally generated coherent reference signal. These are the same signals as what we have used at the transmitter. Let the upper path be called the in-phase channel and the lower path be called the quadrature phase channel. Let the correlator outputs in the in-phase and quadrature phase channels be denoted by x1 and x2 respectively. Each of these correlator outputs are then compared with a threshold of 0 volts in each branch using a decision device. You should note the threshold is 0 because we have said at the transmitter the input binary sequence is represented in its polar form. So the average value of a signal represented in its polar form is 0 and that is why the threshold will be 0. Now depending upon whether x1 is greater than the threshold or less than the threshold, a corresponding decision will be made in the upper as well as the lower part. In fact, I have given the decisions here for in-phase channel which is the upper part. If the coefficient x1 is greater than 0, then a decision is made in favor of symbol 1. On the other hand, if the coefficient x1 is less than 0, then a decision is made in favor of symbol 0. A very similar approximation is also applied for the lower channel which is the quadrature phase channel. So if x2 is greater than 0, decision is made in favor of symbol 1 and if x2 is less than 0, decision is made in favor of symbol 0. Finally, these two binary sequences at the in phase and quadrature channel outputs are combined by using a multiplexer to produce the original binary sequence at the transmitter input with the minimum probability of symbol error. Let us see how this multiplexing is made. Here I have shown a small table to indicate the same. x1 represents the output of the in phase channel, x2 represents the output of the quadrature phase channel. If x1 and x2 are both 0, 0, then the multiplexed QPSK signal is 0, 0. x1 and x2 are 0, 1, the multiplex signal is 0, 1. In a very similar fashion, you can construct the remaining two QPSK signals. So, you can see by this table, the output of the receiver is nothing but the debit information of the QPSK system. Therefore, you can now say the QPSK receiver will successfully regenerate the input binary sequence at the output. Right, that is about this brief discussion on QPSK transmitter and receiver. In my next video, I will derive an expression for the average probability of error in making this decision. So, stay tuned. If you like this video, kindly press that like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos on digital communication. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.